Good morning. I think we're going to get started on this cold, blustery Kentucky day and welcome Dr. Richard Bello to campus at the great University of Louisville. We still will say go fighting Irish for you today, but we might mumble it, sir. <laughs> Dr. Billow's here. Um, he is the Associate Vice President for Research and Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, he's been five years in this position, so he's uh, quite accustomed to the cold weather. Came from the uh, University of Texas before he went to Notre Dame. So he's used to these temperature swings. What we can tell you here is we'll put you right in the middle of all that. Uh, something interesting, I asked him, you know, what was something interesting that wasn't on his Vita? And he said he's a boat builder and he loves the arts and he attributes that to uh, his wife educating him. On the arts. <laughs> <laughs> on, on the arts, not the boat building. Thank you, Dr. Villa, for being here. We're looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you inviting me back uh, to your lovely campus. Uh, I don't know whether you knew it. I grew up in West Virginia, and I right next door to you. And, and you always hear about the rivalry between the Hatfields and McCoys. And <clears throat> my roommate was a Hatfield, who was dating a McCoy <laughs> when I was a student, because they live right on the border between each other. I wanted to talk to you today about uh, research. This will be a little bit different talk. It is not comprehensive about the entire Office of the Vice President for Research and what should be done. I get a lot of questions uh, from you and from others about how do you build a research program? Dr. Billow, you've been blessed. Everywhere you've been, the research program has grown. And I used to say, well, that's just God's blessing. And Notre Dame said, God gave you a gift, Richard. And it's a process. And, uh, there are certain things that I look for in a university uh, in order for the way these processes work best, especially for collaborative work, and some of which I'll share with you today. I'm going to talk about the Great American University because I was educated uh, as a PhD candidate that the 21st century American university was going was to be like this. They said, you watch. This is what it's going to be. 21st century and look for these kinds of universities to lead. They will be metropolitan universities. They'll be in the cities. They will be large. And they'll be surrounded by the corporations and engaged with the corporations and engaged with the community. They'll be vital assets. They'll be marked by access, excellence, and impact. And so what you learned as you've seen this around the country these universities uh, growing at unprecedented rates. And you see people either reacting one of three ways, especially to this access. They resist it, or they accommodate it. And I say that neither is sufficient for this 21st century metropolitan university. You've got to embrace it and restructure your operations so that you can accommodate accents and still provide excellent undergraduate education, excellent research, and excellent engagement with the community so you're viewed as a vital resource. There are universities that have done this in the country. You see University of Michigan has been successful at this. Uh, Berkeley has done this, public universities. Stanford, obviously. Uh, you see it right now going on at George Mason. One of the major reasons Amazon located there and right next to George Mason was because of the workforce they have available at New York George Mason. So we must embrace it. My job is to look at how can I embrace this great American university in the 21st century by building, maintaining, and excellence in the research program. So impact is important. Never chase the money. It's not about the money. It's making a difference in society. That's what I mean. What should the goals be? Increase the scale of research, but increase the impact of your research and your creative endeavors. Money is just a metric. If you're doing these things, if you're focusing on impact, the funding comes. You want to be a force for good. You've got a medical school. Change the world. These are the goals that you want. 
You don't go after something because it's easy funding. You want to go after things that are going to make an impact on the world. That's how you achieve preeminence and distinction. And that's going to happen in the metropolitan universities because you are so engaged with the needs of the community. What do I mean by impact? It's not a metric. People ask me one time, how do you measure it? It's not a measure. It's what you choose in the beginning. We had a professor angry at me one time because White Sands Missile Test Center contract was up for grabs. We're Notre Dame. Let's go and bid on that and win it. It's $35 million a year. Well, who wants to go out in the desert and shoot off missiles? It's not what we're about. Right? We want to make a difference in the world. Right? And you'll see the growth that we experience is because of these these goals and being careful about what we choose to do because we want to be distinctive. Let's change the world. Now, one of the things we had to learn was as the trustees came to us in Office of Vice President Church and said, we want to know where we're weak. If we want to achieve preeminence, we want to know where we're weak. What are we not doing? So we looked at the top 15 universities in the country, science and engineering universities. We looked at them from their, the beginning of their history and traced each one of them to the present day to look at what made them so successful. And this is what we saw in all of them, this common pattern. And I, I don't want to go through all of this with you because I do want to stop this at 20 minutes so you have time for questions. But the difference between those that became great and those that became OK was right there in the laboratories. That was the difference maker. If they took the funding they had available from the state, if they took what they raised from their endowment and put it into the laboratories, they became great universities. You want to know why? Because those laboratories attracted the top professors and the best graduate students. Look at what you started to do here. You have your bucks for brains. You put money into like this additive manufacturing center that helped attract top, which you're endowed shares today. Right? That's the way that process works. Right? Now, in these schools, it, it became a very cyclical process. Those top professors came. That attracted the top undergraduates. When those undergraduates get in their 40s, they start contributing to the endowment because they, especially if you're an undergraduate school, they love their school, which then you make the decision how you're going to use it. If it goes back to the laboratories, it kind of works like this. There was a time when Colgate University was equivalent to Cornell. Cornell put their money into buildings. I mean, Colgate put their money into buildings. Cornell put their money in the laboratories. Okay. The other thing you need to do is retain them and attract them. Bucks for brains, the free, you've, got to, you've got to engage in the free agency of attracting top faculty and retaining top faculty. That's what you started with Bucks for Brains. And that's why you've got these people. You engaged in that game. We lose more of our faculty to Cornell than any other university in the country because they pick up our up-and-comers and pull them over. How? We can't compete with that. The last guy we lost to Cornell, I couldn't believe it when he told me. He says, don't even bother to, to, to match it. They gave me $80 million endowment for my research. Whoa. And they gave me another $20 million to supplement my generous salary. I just, it's like, yeah, good luck, David. <laughs> But you see, you've got to engage in the free agency to retain. But those laboratories are critical for your growth. OK. So <clears throat> I asked Notre Dame, why are you calling me? You're Notre Dame. You've put $80 million into new laboratories in the last five years. And they showed me some data. And they go, yeah, we have. 
And what's happened in the last three years is research has gone down, down, down. Oh. Because you build it doesn't mean they'll come. It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. Why are you hiring me? Because you've been successful every place you've been in growing research programs. And we want you to do it here. And we want you to turn it around in the first year. OK. No, not a problem. <clears throat> so uh, what you learn at this, in this process, you do this long enough, is I started benchmarking other vice presidents that had been extremely successful. And I called them, people that I knew. What was it? <clears throat> and as a woman that used to be VPR at Maryland, she ended up being the provost at uh, Santa Barbara. She's retired now old friend of mine, she says, Richard, these are the things that you've got to put in place. These are blocks. In each one of these blocks, you will develop tactics for, formal processes. And you'll call those things that don't work in each of these blocks, and you'll try new things, and the things will change that you do depending on circumstances in the nation. And for example, organizing research development, well, what does that mean? We'll talk about that. Know your faculty. This is why I like a university like this. You've got to know what your faculty can do, and you have to understand their personalities. I could never do what I do at Texas A&M. They have 7,000 faculty. Right? I need to know what you do here. Right? Identify and communicate funding opportunities. This means, this does not mean just putting out a list once a week or once a month of what the opportunities are out there. The faculty view that as spam. That's not what we're talking about here. You personalize this. Cultivate the agency program managers. I'm going to talk about that. Increase your proposal submissions. Improve the proposal quality. Critical for NSF and NIH. Single most important thing you could do to win NSF and NIH is improve the proposal quality. I'll tell you why. And Recognize the faculty research success. You do that here. And we don't do that where I'm at. We've got this humility. It's hubris. That's hubris. We don't, we don't do that. We're, we're Catholics. <laughs> OK. I'm going to talk about what we've done. And I do want to relate this to our experiences. What we've done, some, just a snippet of what we've done for many of these, to give you an idea of how this process works. And it's different every place you go. What you do is, is different. In each year, in each of these blocks, we call those things that don't work, and we try new things. What's important above all of this, and this really should have been the header, why you're doing this, you must understand, as a senior administrator, your job is to make the faculty successful, not yourself. You're a steward. You're a steward. I translate that to, I want to help them do the things they love to do. And you get great collaboration, great cooperation when they know you and they understand that you're doing this for them. That's what underlies all of this. And that's why this is working. Let's talk about a few of these. How did we organize? We framed our term called our hunters. So this is called formerly research development. You're trying to identify and cultivate opportunities to increase the probability of success. Now, how do you organize? You could organize by pulling the associate deans together. We did that when I was in Texas. Associate dean of science, associate dean of engineering, associate dean of nursing. We all worked together to grow the grants. And we all, grew, all three colleges grew because we liked each other we shared that same passion to grow the research. All three colleges grew in their research programs and in their laboratories. Okay. Other places, like we try to hear with this group, let's focus on the agencies and we'll put each person in charge of an agency. That lasted about two weeks. It's too hard to do. You can't keep track of everything. And you're not an expert in everything those agencies do. What we found was is we organized by what I call the passionate participants in our research centers. That might be the director, that might be the associate director. But they were very passionate 
about growing research for their center. This is how we organized. The vice president of research, he operates at the university level. He spends most of his time in Washington. He is making the initial introduction to the agencies. We've got two military advisors and former NSF deputy director that gets us those meetings set up in those agencies. And we, uh, we look for first, through our Federal Relations Office, our alumni. And they get us in. It's the, always the alumni. He makes the connection. And what was happening before I came there, why were you dropping after $80 million? And he, he's look into this, and it was very clear. He had no help, so he would make these connections. He'd bring them back to the faculty, follow up on this. They get busy. It wasn't happening. There was no connection between him and the faculty. It was getting lost. He had no associate vice presidents. He had no help. He was trying to do it all himself. Very successful center director at Purdue before he came to Notre Dame. And I says, okay, Bob, you make the connection. I will investigate it. I will cultivate it. And I will not give up until it's on contract or it dies. Right? That was my role, is to look into these opportunities or these agencies in follow-up. He might make a, a, a tie with the director of IARPA. I would bring the director of IARPA in to meet the faculty, talk about what they're doing, we'll talk about what we're doing. Right? We'll talk more about that. We then created this working group at the center level, volunteer only. I didn't want interested observers. I wanted the passionate participants. So these were people that we knew that we'd known for a while. We took them to lunch. I took them to lunch. This is what we want to do. We were criticized by the trustees that everybody was going off of their own direction and trying to win awards. It says, let's come together, our best people, and let's come up with a joint plan for the university of how we're going to fund research, how we're going to get research for the university. These were people that got along with each other. They liked each other. They were very good at what they do. We had senior people very good at getting grants. We had junior people that wanted to learn how to do this. They were either center directors or associate directors. Okay. We come together every two weeks. We develop strategies, and we carry those out. We hold each other accountable. It's kind of embarrassing when you show the proposals you're working on, uh, and all your colleagues are in that room showing their proposals, and you come in and say, I'm not prepared. That becomes a self-punishing kind of accountability. Okay, but it was purely volunteer. We start off with five, we're up to 12 now. We've got the center directors, we have foundation relations, we have uh, the social science center director now, and we have the liberal arts uh, 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 associate vice president, because okay? we have an international component. And out of $180 million in awards, these people were responsible for cultivating and bringing in $108 million of that this last fiscal year. And you see the results of just the activity. Then we've got these very special laboratories that are so critical to the community that you had to have a dedicated person doing the business development, or we call the research development for them. This was our turbo machinery laboratory. $35 million investment. The power bill alone for this facility fixed before you use any power, is $80,000 a month. It has 40 full-time staff in it. We put this in the poorest section of town, in the old Studebaker corridor, because it had been torn down. And we said, you know, we want to put something there. It's a shame, the biggest employer in this city, we're celebrating the 50th year closing of it. It's a shame. Let's put something space age there. This facility does now $8 million a year in research. And has 40 full-time uh, people working for it. And we, we have a payment in lieu of taxes uh, mechanism so that those, rather than paying taxes, we pay in lieu of taxes. So it's legal. And those funds go back to that community. That's something that was really important to me, personally. These are some of the things this group does. I understand, though, with this, though, we needed a de dedicated person, full-time, that does the business development for that. And it's turbo machinery, it's turbine engine testing. But these are some of the things that this working group does. Agency campus visits, proposal conference attendance, forming collaborative teams. And this is like an activity happens two or three times a week. 
exploring emerging researchers. You just did not want to respond to solicitations coming out. We wanted mechanisms to strategically identify what's emerging in the country, what's new. We didn't want to be catching up. We wanted to lead. So we have mechanisms in place to look at what's emerging in the country. Proposal identification communication, nimble proposal response. These are all issues we had problems with that we needed to put systems in place. Okay? So that's how we've organized. Other problems. Notice here, cultivating research agency CPMs. These are all the groups that came to visit us just in the last year. Right? You notice some, who's missing on there? Who would you think would be on here that's not on here? NSF and NIH, that's right. There's a reason for that, okay? We'll talk about that. This is something we realized in 2017. I had to take the, the uh, ordinate data off there because it's proprietary. Couldn't show you the data, but it's the trends that are important. We had a theory. God bless Bob Bernard, he had the theory and he had me look into it. We looked at our awards over the last several years. We saw that we've got two kinds of work going on. Science uh, agency work and mission directed agency work. And we realized, notice there, the science agencies, NSF and NIH, dithering. Dithering. No trend. Up or down. Just kind of, now how's that happen? Hiring 300 new faculty and 80 million dollars in investment. But the, where we've been cultivating the mission directed agencies, Grow, 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 grow. And in 2017, we're already up to 40%. Today, it's 50% of the research or mission-directed agencies. The two groups respond differently. Mission-directed agencies, it's about a relationship between you and the program manager. That program manager and maybe one other person make the decision to fund you. They want to know that you can do the work, that you're going to get the work done on time, you're going to be respectful and you work well with others, right? and you're meeting a need. So them and their boss or them, that person and one other person make the decision to fund you. Cultivation. This is why all those agencies were on campus, why we visit DC to meet with them. NRO, they come in. A few weeks later, they say, we see an opportunity. It's worth $2 million a year to us. Please propose. Like that. that happens a lot. The mission-directed agencies, it's not. Yes, you need to know the program manager, but it's the panels. And what we saw there was the focus has got to be on superior proposals. And I'll show you what we do. That, the focus there was proposal quality. I'll show you what's happened as we go along. Know the faculty capability. We had a strategic planning group, went on for about six months. We needed to know the whole process all of us that do research development, my group that does federal grants, corporations, the corporate relations people, the foundation relations people, we looked at every aspect of it and said, what are we missing? Where are we weak? This was one area. We have about 30 faculty a year that leave for one reason or another, and we hire 30 new faculty a year. We could not keep up with knowing what everybody did. So we said, Let's, this is a good place for a, 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 some, a software tool to help us. So we commissioned one of these startup companies that had an interest in this area to develop a, a package that would scrape any, every available piece of information on the web about each of our faculty. And so when an opportunity would arise, the software would not only identify the opportunity, but it would show us all the faculty that could respond to this opportunity. Now in terms of communicating, that's why I say you don't go out and just put a list out there. We pick up the phone. Ryan, we've got an opportunity here. I want you to take a look at it. And by the way, can you work with Peter, Alex, etc.? We'd like to pursue this. Let me know what you think. We do this almost every day of the week. As, as we were missing. We didn't know capability. We knew some people. We knew maybe 100 people. But that wasn't our faculty especially in the liberal arts. Similar to that, 
we were missing opportunities. For example, we knew that there were MOUs being developed between the National Science Foundation and its uh, UK counterpart. Five of those went out last year solicitations in response to that MOU for $2 million grants, multiple $2 million grants. We never saw three of them. The British consulate called us on the fourth, and by the time we saw the fifth one, it was too late. We said, we don't want to do this again. So our software identifies immediately when the opportunity arises. We'd already been to London because we were to set up relationships with universities over there to be ready for it when it came in. And so when it hit, I was able to identify the faculty very quickly to respond to that. Right. And we've already got the relationships set, set up with the Brits, in both Imperial College and Durham. And we're setting up, a, we've got a C grant program we're putting in place where the only objective, the only deliverable is prepare and submit an NSF grant to this, this program right. to be ready. You see how the tactics, the, it's very deliberate. Proposal quality. This is what I'm going to talk about, NSF and NIH, as well as the mission-directed agencies. With the junior faculty, proposal training, we'll pick 25 of them a year at most. Right? We'll train them on the career award or NSF or NIH. But the difference is, is we then have that former NSF program director, deputy director, mentors them. She comes in from DC every four to six weeks. She reviews the status of their proposals. She's reading them before she gets there. So when she sits down with these, each of these professors, she can give them specific feedback right, on what it's going to take to win. In the meantime, we've got our proposal developers working and editing with each of those young professors on improving those proposals. Some people call them grant writers. These are people that, they're consultants, I pay each of them $90 an hour. They're very, very good. We also provide illustration services for them. But you see the impact. Since I've been there, 46 career awards, it's six to eight a year typically. 17 uh, DOD Young Investigator Awards, or DOE Young Investigator Awards. And most recently, uh, this past year, two PCASE Awards. For the senior people, we needed for the large proposals, red team reviews in addition to these other services. These are colleagues that we bring in from around the country. We pay them an honorarium and it's a mock review panel. We usually have them do this one or two weeks before the proposals do and they completely critique that as if they were an NSF or an NIH panel. That has helped our award rate for the science-based agencies go way up. We just won our first NSF Engineering Research Center. We won, for a university without a, 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 a medical school, our largest NIH grant, $12.5 million. This SRC jump for semiconductors was a $25 million award. It is, in the last year, been increased to $44 million. Among these grants, there's about over $200 million just here in awards. Proposal quality, that's all it was. Working very closely to improve the proposal quality. This is the impact, the awards. When I came there, we were doing about 95 million. Last year, we ended the year 180 million. Notice here, a $20 million jump in the third year, that's typical. And in the sixth year, a $40 million jump. It's those big awards of those science-based agencies that was the true increase there. So we fixed that dithering problem. And the expenditures, 175 million to 230 million, because we, we don't count all these awards at once. We, we divide them by the number of years so that we have a steady growth. We don't want this going on. We have a steady growth. So if I have a $50 million award, we'll count 10 million a year. Okay, I'm gonna stop right here and turn it over to you. You get an idea. Is there very proactive tactics that aligned with a strategy.
that's all. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, I enjoyed your presentation very much. My name is Kevin Walsh. I'm Associate Dean of Research and Graduate Study at the Engineering School. Um, I, I, I found some of your, you know, uh, your, your, your ideas very enlightening, you know, and very fresh, that what you're doing. Um, I want to ask you about maybe your comments on two things, uh, and you addressed uh, one of them. One of them with, uh, we, we're fortunate to have some very nice uh, core facilities, and you yes. kind of mentioned that uh, a bit, uh, and I know Notre Dame has uh, some competitive ones as well. One thing we do struggle with, though, is how to support those core facilities, and so I wanted to get your uh, ideas on, uh, you know, your ideas about core facilities and your strategies uh, for supporting them. And then the second one, uh, the other thing we kind of struggle with, I think, are startup packages and uh, cost share. And I, I wouldn't mind getting to hear your ideas of, about those. Right now, both of those are pretty much the responsibility of the colleges. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like to get your opinion on those. Okay, the first one, when you, the, uh, on the core facilities, when you say support them, do you mean keep them modern and up to date? Is yes. that what you mean? Uh -huh. and, and where do the funds come from? Okay. Is it done at the college level? Is it, uh, uh, is it done? Oops. Is it done at your office? The core facilities are run by my office, and are administered and managed by my office. Uh, we do two mechanisms for the core uh, to keep them up to date. And we struggle just like everybody else does, especially with the microscopy and spectroscopy equipment that these scopes just cost millions and millions of dollars. We have, first of all, the, uh, what we call the uh, Equipment Renovation and Renewal Program. Uh, the, it's a million dollar fund total. We allow up to $200,000 for renovation or modernization of equipment. We, it is almost always the core facilities that it's limited to, not a faculty member's individual research lab. So that is one mechanism that we use to help keep them up to date. The other mechanism that we use, and this is a passion program of mine, is we use the MRI, especially with the changes in the structure in the MRI. Uh, we're, uh, uh, we're very, very successful with the MRI program. It didn't used to be that way. We went 10 years without winning an MRI. And when I took over that team, I could see why people were pushing their pet projects rather than paying attention to the unwritten criteria. So we'll typically win one or two MRI awards that gets the big renewals that we need. Okay. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. And have, being the faculty member, I think that's won our first MRI here back in the 90s. Mm -hmm. That works for some tools. It doesn't work for what I call workhorse tools. You know, so you need an SEM. It's hard to um, get that through an NSF uh, uh, MRI program. But I yes. agree that it is for the the you know the sexy science-based uh, new equipment but yes uh, it's difficult with the workhorse tools. it, it is in in uh, and people under, understand people when with a university like notre dame all they see is an 11.8 billion dollar endowment and they think that it's christmas uh but uh what, what you realize is, is there's a reason that it's that high and uh, I remember my first six months there, I was getting, I totaled them up. I was getting requests from faculty, naive faculty, honestly, that was totaling $450 million a month in requests for equipment, a month. And that happened for three or four months. And you realize that this university is, they expect you to do everything you can to get something externally funded. If you're successful with some of that, and we, we cut a deal, we'll take care of the rest. Right? But you need to come in with that kind of, I, I learned it in turbo machinery. Uh, I had to go out and raise, I raised $4.3 million in equipment for that from the city, then another $2.5 million from the state. Notre Dame said, we'll match that $7 million with their own funds, you did a good job, if you can get General Electric to agree to a five-year grant, which was $13.5 million. I was in great position. I've got $7 million. The university's putting up $7 million GE. I need $13.5 million in, in, in a research grant. Uh, uh, they were quite 
voluminous in their concerns over that. And I go, well, I've got $15 million. Nobody else in the country has that. It'll cost you $250 million to build this facility on your own site. Let me know what you want to do. We have a $13.5 million grant. And how about in terms of startup packages and cost shared? Is that, <coughs> is that done at the college level? How do you uh, envision that if you had this position here? Uh, I, every university is different. Uh, it depends on the culture of the university. Uh, in Texas, it was at the college level uh, with support by the provost. Uh, but the FNA distribution was also very different. In, it followed the, in all these places, it follows the FNA distribution. Notre Dame is, because it is a Catholic organization, the funds are kept at the top. And uh, the colleges have enough to support uh, salaries, uh, but not much more. So those decisions and those packages come from at the provost level at, at Notre Dame, because it is a very top-down driven organization. But it, you really, what you find with these packages, you look at the distribution model of the FNA, and that's almost always, that's where you're going to see those funds for startup packages come from. It's very hard to influence that. You know, obviously, if, if FNA, if you, you mess with that model, you're taking funding away from somebody, give it to someone else. And one thing I've learned in a university is you don't want to make your first actions being messing with somebody's money. <laughs> You'll be short-lived. You'll be very short in your position. So, Th yes. Thank you, Dr. Bello. I have a question from JC States online, and he's asking, what's the source of funds used to support these programs? And I'm, I believe, and JC, make sure you uh, type in if I say this incorrectly. I believe he's speaking to the development to increase the um, uh, I'm thinking, hold on. You talked about bringing in outside entities to look at the strength of your proposals. Yes. And I believe that's what JC is asking. Yes. Uh, we pay for that in the Office of the Vice President for Research. Understand, those are honorariums. We pay each person $1,000, and we cover their travel expenses. It's well worth it when your grant is above $5 million. How about the uh, $90 an hour you were talking about we, you pay? We pay for that out of our office. Awesome. Thank you. Now, understand, we got blessed with these, these two women. They are the wives of faculty. They just started up a separate business, but they're very, very good. I don't know how hard it would be to replicate that, but they're just very good, and, and that's a very reasonable rate. Thank you. Mm. kind of uh, alluded to Notre Dame's big endowment. Yes. Relatively big. I guess if you're Harvard, not so big. But if you're U of L, big. Mm -hmm. How do you see yourself being successful coming from a Notre <clears throat> Dame to a, back to a public university? And maybe you want to talk a little bit about uh, your experience at UT Arlington, which mm -hmm. is more a, a peer of U of L. By the way, I'm Emmanuel Collins, Dean of uh, Speed School. Okay. Oh, great. For one thing, uh, you learn very quickly at Notre Dame, the last thing you want to do is ask about funds from the endowment. Uh, you will be chastised quickly and severely. Uh, it is not something that has gone to quickly. Half the growth in the endowment each year is applied towards uh, undergraduate scholarships to help pay their tuition. And that's a commitment the university always has. Uh, a lot of the rest of that is for the building growth that they have. So there is very little funds for other things, and you had better not ask for it. Uh, you go, just like I did in Texas, when I would go to the provost asking for funds for something, it was always a deal. Example, and it's no different in Notre Dame. Okay? Notre Dame, just like in Texas, it's we want to build a hypersonics facility. We needed $5.4 million for that. We raised all of those funds from Durup grants. When I was a million dollars short, I went to DARPA. I knew the director of DARPA, and, uh, uh, and he, he was responsible for hypersonics anyway, and, and 
we, we worked on a million dollar uh, award there. To, to branch. So I walked in with four million dollars in get, uh, grants uh, awarded. And then the deal with the university was, and they made it with the, with, uh, the Department of Defense was, is then they would put the metal building around it. So we raised 80% uh, 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 of the co uh, cost ourselves, and Notre Dame put in the other 20%. That's the way it works, and that's the same way it worked in Texas. When I, we built the Center for Renewable Energy Science and Technology, we had a gutted out old wet lab, good for nothing. It was gutted out back to the concrete. Uh, I needed a million dollars for that. Uh, DOE agreed out of the one and a half million dollars they gave us, I could apply 500,000. And I went to the provost and said, we've generated over seven million dollars in FNA. We've never asked for a dime of it. DOE will pay for half the cost of the renewal of this gutted out lab. Can you put up the other half, another 500,000? That's a great deal. It's got to be something like that. No matter where you are, it's got to be something like that. So, Dr. Bello, uh, this is Dave Hine from Pharmacology and Toxicology. Um, very impressed with your presentation. Thank you, sir. Um, to just, so I understand, um, at Notre Dame, um, research performance was modest, and they brought you in, and things got much better. So my question for you is, <clears throat> when you're looking at the position here as Executive Vice President for Research and Innovation, how much of what you did at Notre Dame would you be able to do here in the top spot and would you be able to transfer this, um, th this technique and, and these ideas to an associate vice president? Would that be your plan to hire someone like yourself to do what you did at Notre Dame? I, knowing myself, I like to keep very close to the faculty. And it's because I just enjoy them. I live vicariously through what they do because I think what they do is exciting. Uh, our greatest growth spurts, you saw the steady growth in those first few years. Uh, I was at a capacity, personally. And when the trustees said, uh, you, you're one person and there's a lot of individuals doing, trying to do what you're doing, come together. Uh, that really made a difference. And, and we, like I say, we, we coined the term passionate participant or hunters. We, uh, we looked at those people that were very, very good at what they were doing. They had the right kinds of personalities, and we brought them together. And uh, that's what we look for here, is how do we organize ourselves. And it can be informal. This was a working group, volunteer. They don't come every, every, every time because they're busy, and I don't ask them to come every time. Uh, they're there when they can be there. But even in Texas, it was those people that were passionate. For us, it was informally the associate deans. Uh, we had a vision of what we wanted to do. And we each had different strengths. And, uh, and we liked each other. It's the same here. It's, uh, you pull together the people that really want to make a difference. They love what they do. And it, I don't know who those are. I don't know whether your associate deans, your center directors, associate directors, or individual professors. But you bring them together. And together, you pull up a blank sheet of paper, show what's been done in other places, and you just tr try things. And you adjust them as the world changes. We knew at the San Bernardino, San Bernardino shootings a few years ago that it was going to be a change in what was happening in this country. And we quickly reorganized what we were doing to be able to support uh, national defense or security. At that time, we were doing about 200,000, maybe 300,000 in work. Two years later, we were doing over 8 million, close to 10 million. Okay? And it was just taking what people were doing and refocusing. Okay? It's, you've got to do the same thing here. It's, 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 we are a university. You can't make people do what they want. You know? And so what do you do? You have them do what they love to do. It's just finding those individuals that, 
that want to come together and try some of these things. But you've got to have the processes in place. If you don't, you might have the laboratories, but nothing will change. You've got to proactively do things. You know, and it, it clicked with me when VPR and I were, we were at a, an event for the university and all the professors were there. And they were kidding. They were kidding me. He says, oh my gosh, Rich, you know, Bob, don't ever give Bill your, your, cell, your cell phone number. Don't ever do that because he's going to call you and bug the heck out of you until you look at this or that. But so you look for people with that same kind of vigor and you've got them here. Yeah, I've heard it in just in my couple of hours here this morning, individuals. And why do they do it? And why do they listen to me? I don't think I was ever a great engineer. Just pretty darn good at getting great engineers to do what I wanted. Why? Because I'm helping them do what they want. That's all. Can I do it here? I never make promises. You just have fun. You just have fun. Try some things. Don't work. You try some other things. Good things happen. Hello, Dr. Billow. This is Armand Perry. Um, yeah, I remember the you, School Armand. of Social Work. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And so you talked <laughs> about the idea of sort of putting people together and uh, cultivating groups of people to allow them or facilitate them doing what they love. You also talked about the idea that the, the work is less about money and it's more about following mission. And so I'm interested in hearing you talk specifically about people who love doing things that are outside of the STEM fields. Can you speak specifically about some of your examples and how it is you've done those things with people who, yes. whose work is not connected to NSF or NIH or yes. agencies yes. along those lines? Yes, uh, because Notre Dame, by and far, is a liberal arts university. We have 1,200 faculty. Only 350 of them are engineering and science. The rest are the liberal arts. And so we are charged with increasing the external research of them too. Our biggest challenge was Notre Dame is a rich university. There are 140 internal grant programs. And the liberal arts faculty were hitting every one of them and completely funding their research programs. That's the culture that you're up against. Okay. Uh, things that we have done, some of the successes have been, uh, what's critical is getting to know them. You have to know them. We learned that. Uh, if you bring an opportunity to them and they don't know you, they'll just ignore it. But getting to know them personally, and one of the most successful uh, collaborations we have is with the classicists. Her job is the translation of 12th century Latin documents. But she works more with the computer scientists than anybody in the arts and letters. Well, I got to know her. We got to be friends. She comes over for Thanksgiving. We did work together. We liked each other. And as opportunities would come up, say, Gundy, look at this. What do you think? That's a great idea. So she's, do, she's, got, she's working in computer science on natural language processing now. She's working with another computer scientist that's taking handwritten 12th century documents by popes in, in doing artificial <coughs> intelligence to translate them, things like this. Uh, the liberal arts, the, their greatest success have been in two areas. They hit the foundations hard. The Templeton Foundation and the Lilly Endowment, they're getting awards from four to seven million dollars. Right? And so our Foundation Relations, who's on our working group, works closely to engage them in proposals for the foundations. And that's most of the foundation funding that we're getting are with the liberal arts. Uh, finally, uh, Notre Dame ranks number one in NEH awards. The reason for that is, is we've got a group, we call them ISLA. These are liberal arts professors that support the winning of NEH, NEH grants in the liberal arts. So they will show them uh, former winning grants, they will show them how to submit, they'll critique how they write them, etc. And I lend my people to help them with that. So it's those kinds of things that go on, but honestly, 
The two things that we found are successful, and we're still trying to break down those barriers, is one, they need to know you, trust. And two, you have to look at their research records. If they show a, a, a past record of uh, external grants, yes, you work with them. If there's no past record of grants, you don't work with them because they'll turn you down flat every single time. So those are, we see two ingredients that are critical for working with them. But honestly, it's been the foundations where they've really, they've really, really done well. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bello, we appreciate you being with us today. Do you have any questions? We have just a couple of minutes. Do you have any questions for the audience you have? And I'll run around mm -hmm. with them. Just a comment. Just a comment. Uh, it's a good day. Yeah. Kentucky got taken down last night. This is a good, good day. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Bello. Mm -hmm. Thank you.